bright eyes and smiling faces this morning. Uh, at VCF, when we're looking at a new business opportunity or even in reviewing our current clients, one of our analytical processes, much like you folks look at, is we look at the five C's of credit. So we're doing an in-depth analysis of the collateral. We're looking at the capital that's embedded in the business. We're looking at the capability of the company to service our debt. We're also looking at the condition of not only the business, but the industry they operate in. The last, but certainly not least, C that we look at is the character. It's the character of the owners and the key management team that we're dealing with. We want to know that those folks are going to be there with us, not just when things are going good, but also, probably more importantly, when things are not going so good. Um, our guest speaker today has become an expert in looking into the character of individuals. I have no doubt that during his career he's also probably seen quite a few characters as well. Uh, Adam started his career with the FBI in 1996 in the San Diego Division. Uh, during his time there he was a proud member of the San Diego Division SWAT team and then he went on and furthered his expertise and focus into white collar crime and public corruption. In 2005, Adam moved uh, to the Washington Division, and he basically worked on the executive staff of the FBI Cyber Division, reporting to the assistant director focused on cyber crime in the United States. He also served as coordinator for the White Collar Crime Program and supervisor for its financial crime squad. From uh, 2009 to 2012, Adam was appointed as the assistant special agent in charge of Washington's operational hunt program within their intelligence division, which led to Adam becoming the chief of the FBI's public corruption and civil rights section uh, from 2012 to 2014. In this division, uh, Adam headed up the investigations of hate crimes, human trafficking, white collar corruption, both in elected and appointed officials. He also looked at other offenses against the civil liberties that we as Americans hold very dear and we literally look at it as our rights as Americans and as citizens that we do. In January of 14, Adam was appointed as a special agent in charge of the FBI's Richmond Division. Uh, in his role there, Adam and his group provide federal, national security and criminal investigative resources to 82 of Virginia's 95 counties. He and his wife, his son and twin daughters, reside here in Richmond, and it is my pleasure as well as my honor to introduce Adam Lake. Thanks, uh, good morning. I'm gonna stand at the podium. I, I ordinarily am not a big podium fan, but uh, I don't know if my mic's working, so. Um, this is a sophisticated group. So I'm going to be sort of extemporaneous. And I'd like this uh, to the extent possible to be a conversation. So if I'm hitting on something that's of interest to you or there's an area you want to take the conversation and I'm not hitting it uh, just right, raise your hand, let me know, and we'll go there. Um, so uh, who has, quick show of hands, had interaction in your professional lives with the FBI? And I don't mean subject of a case, I just mean. <laughs> so a couple of you. Um, when I speak to groups, even groups uh, that, uh, uh, at, at, at the level of, uh, of our group here this morning, I'm surprised sometimes at how little folks actually know about my organization, the FBI. Obviously, uh, uh, Hollywood has, has uh, tried uh, largely unsuccessfully to characterize us in, in fictional accounts. Uh, you've heard about us uh, certainly from our casework uh, in the media, in the news media, uh, but the FBI uh, largely sort of works uh, in the shadows. In fact, certainly in our national security mission, I would say on our best day, uh, you never hear about uh, the successes because we've mitigated something that didn't uh, ultimately uh, go boom. Um, and so that's that's a, a gold standard success for us. You never read about it, and uh, and it's a it's a win for the country. But the FBI is really uh, two agencies in one, sort of three agencies in one. But we are principally uh, a national security agency. So if you look at the priorities of the FBI, number one is to uh, counter the next terrorist attack on the United States. Um, 
with no real close second place. That is the first uh, priority of the FBI, it's counterterrorism. Number two is counterintelligence, which means protecting the United States and its interests and its infrastructure from uh, hostile um, foreign intelligence activity here in the United States. And then uh, three is the cyber, the national security cyber threat, which we're going to talk a little bit about today. Because um, it does impact certainly commercial interests of the United States, it impacts the, the critical infrastructure of the United States. But hostile uh, uh, nation state uh, cyber intrusion activity uh, here in the United States. Those are the top three priorities. Then at number four, we get into our first <coughs> criminal investigative priority, which is really sort of where we meet the community most often. Uh, certainly through the news media is, is in, our, in our criminal uh, investigative programs. So I said we're a national security agency, we're also a criminal investigative agency. Uh, highest priority for, for us on our criminal investigative side is uh, public corruption. So elected appointed officials um, who've compromised their position of authority uh, and their position of trust is, is our top criminal investigative priority. Under that is civil rights. Um, so hate crimes, uh, color of law violations, uh, human trafficking, things that sort of bucket under the, the notion of protected civil liberties in the United States and uh, your constitutional protection. So, uh, and then under that is complex financial crime. Um, corporate securities fraud, uh, uh, healthcare fraud, uh, things that really do impact the integrity of our, our commercial uh, infrastructure here in the United States. So, a big mission, right? Uh, what, what are we not? Uh, we are not uh, a police agency. And in a sense, we are a law enforcement agency, but if you call 911, you won't get the FBI. So we don't uh, manage our threats by the inbox, okay? So if you call the FBI, and we chatting out here in the lobby, we had a discussion, because I, I understand the public sometimes gets frustrated with us about these issues, but if you call the FBI and say, hey, listen, this looks like a federal violation to me. That's a federally insured financial institution. Someone stole $3,000 out of my account, and I want the FBI to engage. I'm a taxpayer, do you owe me that? It's like, I've had those conversations. They're not fun conversations, but I remind them that uh, the FBI uh, agent to officer strength, the FBI is one quarter the size of the New York, New York City Police Department. We serve over 300 million people. We have 56 field offices in the United States. We have 70 legal attache offices across the globe, and we have mutual legal assistance treaty agreements with 200 countries uh, to provide sort of collaborative services. So a $3,000 911 call, yes it is a federal violation, 1344 of the United States Code, bank fraud, right? That is a federal violation. But we can't necessarily work every $3,000 case that comes in through the inbox, right? So we have to prioritize. Uh, how do we do that? We do that by incorporating a process through a, a fairly elaborate infrastructure of managing intelligence. So the FBI, National Security Agency, Law Enforcement Criminal Investigative Agency, to a certain extent, we're also a domestic <coughs> intelligence agency. Um, that makes people uneasy sometimes, right? Uh, certainly the privacy advocates aren't crazy about that. But in order to be strategic about how we manage our threats and to ultimately be effective and ultimately bring the greatest value to you, the taxpayers, we need to know what the greatest threats are. How do you do that? Do you do that blindly? Do you do it by guessing? No, you do it by collecting intelligence, processing intelligence, sharing intelligence, and ultimately prioritizing your work based on vetted accurate intelligence. So um, if we need to surge resources to say an emerging healthcare fraud uh, scheme or a tax fraud scheme, uh, wouldn't you, as taxpayers, rather we do that than work the $3,000 bank fraud cases coming in through the door? And the only way to know those things are coming at us, the only way to know those things are having the greatest impact in our communities 
is through valuable intelligence, right? So, the, the white collar threat, it's, it's a difficult <coughs> thing to sort of transition into, I guess it, go ahead. It's like talking to FBI, are we okay? Okay. It's like talking to FBI agents, no one sits in the front. Uh, every, every time we have a, a conference, nobody sits in the front. So, the white collar threat, it is such an elaborate uh, uh, term, it, it, it's such a broad encompassing term to say white collar, right? So white collar is a priority for the FBI, is that cyber? Yes. Is it uh, uh, Corporate securities fraud, yes, what does that mean? Well, that's a pretty broad term. Is it insider threat? Can be. Is it bank fraud? Certainly. Um, is, it, uh, is it criminal enterprise? Uh, so in other words, is it uh, Eastern European criminal organizations that we tri traditionally think of as organized crime? Certainly. Uh, is it a convergence of all of those things? Yes. So the white collar threat is managed uh, sort of across the spectrum of our, uh, our, our criminal infrastructure and the Bureau. Um, and certainly we have to sort of cross-pollinate what we're learning in the Cyber Division with what we're learning in the Criminal Investigative Division with what we're learning on the organized crime components in terms of, st of staying in front of the threat. Um, do, uh, are you familiar with the term Ponzi scheme? Yes. Right, so folks understand that. Do you remember, do you know who Charles Ponzi is? So Charles Ponzi uh, came up with a Ponzi scheme you know, decades and decades ago where he claimed to have access to discounted postal coupons from, from uh, the United States that he was accessing overseas and he was bringing them here to redeem them for face value. He was getting them a discounted value overseas, bringing them here to the United States and, and exchanging them for face value. In order to support that, he needed investments. So he was collecting investments from folks here in the United States, promising them 50% return in 45 days. Right? If you could just pay me this, I could go and, and collect these, buy them, and bring them here. We'll make such a tremendous profit um, that I'll be able to guarantee those types of returns. So the Ponzi scheme was essentially, you guys are probably familiar with this, but it's essentially, um, as long as it grows and I'm able to solicit more and more investors, I can pay earlier investors with the new investor money coming in. And as long as it grows, I'm making my return payments and you're bringing me more clients because you're so impressed with my ability to make good on my promise that it grows and grows and grows. Ultimately, at some point, it implodes. Uh, the brilliance of that scheme, that scheme is alive and well today. Obviously, you've seen the, the the Madoff case, the high profile cases, we've had cases here in Richmond. But the brilliance of that scheme and the morphing and, and, and uh, uh, sort of changing and adapting of that scheme has been such a, such a huge center of, uh, of our investment fraud uh, program in the white collar case. I throw that out as an example of how we've had to sort of adapt and learn because that scheme uh, results in billions of dollars of losses, that just basic elemental scheme of collecting investments, not investing them in what you're telling your investors that you're investing them in, but just returning investments on that money. Um, where well, that money's coming in through cyber investments, through uh, uh, loan schemes, through uh, just investments that aren't really taking place. I throw that out as an example uh, of where we have a threat here in Richmond, in Virginia, that is central to what we're doing uh, with our investigative efforts. Um, so corporate securities fraud, one of the things that, that maybe I can bring to you today is an understanding that uh, with, with what you're seeing, and we talk about character of your investors, we're talking about character of your customers. If, if I can impart anything on you today, it's a culture of security, right? A culture of security in knowing your customer, a culture of security. We, we sort of think when we're doing business, commercial business in the United States, that if we do proper underwriting, if we have a proper workflow, proper business models, 
that we are protecting our company and our investors and ourselves. The reality is, is there are schemers or scammers out there that are looking to exploit that deliberately, not by accident, <clears throat> not by opportunity, but they are coming after your business with the purpose of exploiting your business.